Greetings, salutations, and welcome to After Action. I'm joined for the first time on this program by Daryl. I am here. Uh, today we watched the award-winning Grey Knight. What awards? Uh, best Actor. In? World Fest. <laughs> okay. At least that's what it says on the back of the box. They held their own fest. Uh, well... The best actor, uh, Corbin Burnson, at Worldfest. Amazing. Okay. Um, so, I will ask you the typical question. Uh, watch, don't watch, watch with friends. Please don't watch. <clears throat> I'm going to argue this is a watch. Is it, though? Oh, it is. I mean, you could watch amongst reenactor friends if you really want to, like, have some easy shot nitpicks. But other than that, I, I found it very, very cringeworthy. Uh, and that's part of what makes this so good. Um, okay. This is a, uh, this is one of those, it's so bad, it's good films. Okay. Uh, they were dealing with like a $1.2 million budget and they have like real professional actors on this film. And they tried. They really, really tried. They did try in some, some places. Yes. So. And I have, I have friends that worked on this. It's, it's really funny. Indeed you did. So I, I, I can't disparage everything, but uh, there's a lot to disparage. So uh, I'm going to do the tradition now of reading the back of the box. So, dear listener, bear with me. This will be hard. It's very tiny print. It's very tiny print, and there's a lot of it. I'll start off with quotes. Compelling. Haunting. An assured feature debut. It is. And as from the uh, the Charleston Post, <laughs> <clears throat> a classic psychological horror film, evocative of Apocalypse Now and The Night of the Living Dead, a profound mixture of genres like you've never seen. Robert Fisher, Steadicam. Now I'm going to assume Steadicam is a is a magazine or some such, but I just like to think that it's the Steadicam operator yeah. giving this That's review. The, yeah, he, he <clears throat> thinks that. Now, the interesting thing about this is the director of this film is actually uh, pretty famous, which is kind of weird. Um, George Hinkenlopper? What did he do? Um, Hearts of Darkness? The uh, documentary film about Apocalypse Now? Oh, okay. You know? Yeah. A, a actual good, famous film. So, now we're going to go into its brief description. Mind you, the entire thing is capitalized. It's just it's just capitals the whole All way through. Caps. Yeah. With certain capitals being just bigger. Yeah. <clears throat> the horrors of war have always been <clears throat> the horrors of war have always been evident, and the American Civil War may have been the most terrifying of all. Families were torn apart, friends became enemies, and a large segment of the American population was lost. Battle lines were clearly drawn between North and South. You were either in the Union or in the Confederacy. There was no in-between. That was until May 25th, 1863, when a bizarre, mysterious force began stalking and killing both Union and Confederate soldiers indiscriminately. In this offbeat supernatural thriller by Emmy-winning director George Hingenlopper, Hearts of Darkness, a filmmaker's apocalypse, and <laughs> Sling Blade, <clears throat> Union Captain Jack Harding, Adrian Pulsare, is forced to investigate these gruesome murders by General Matthew Hawthorne, Academy Award, win or Academy Award nominee Martin Sheen, who's convinced that the renegade <clears throat> Confederate Colonel Roger Wilson and his lieutenant, Academy Award-winning Billy Bob Thornton, are behind it all. Reluctant, reluctantly, Harding agrees, but insists on listening. And by the way, the punctuation in this is awful as well. Yeah. Uh, <clears throat> reluctantly, Harding agrees, but insists on listening the help of a Confederate colonel, now prisoner of war, Nemaya Strain, Golden Globe nominee Corbin Burnson. Um, once the student and mentor at West Point... Now turned bitter rivals by war. The two must join ranks to track down the mysterious menace that's destroying the entire regiment. Yeah, that destroying entire drawer regiments deep within the Tennessee Valley. Accompanying them on their mission is Union Colonel George Thalman, Ray Wise, their photographer, Tony Award-winning Jefferson Mays, and Rebecca, 
Cynthia Williams, a runaway slave, who is believed to have some sort of connection with these atrocities. All four journey to the heart of the war and into the heart of what brought them to this crossroads. However, the deeper they go, the more the battle lines become blurred between blue and gray, black and white, sanity and madness. To combat the perilous menace, they are forced to put the war and all it represents behind them. Wow. <clears throat> I mean, it's it really does have a, a mildly star-studded cast. I mean, especially for today, it's got Ray Wise. It's got Matt LeBlanc. It has Martin Sheen. Um, Billy Bob Thornton. Um, it, what was it? David Arquette? Yep. And um, Adrian Passer. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so this is actually the director's cut. The director's cut is called Grey Knight. Um, there were two other versions of this film released. They were The Killing Box and... Ghost Battalion. Yeah. Even though um, they weren't ghosts. Yeah. They, they, they weren't. Yes. They were tribal-themed zombies. Yes. So we're, we're going to be into spoiler territory from this point forward. That so was a major spoiler. Well, yes. Because we were thinking that it was about a confederate knight. Yes, uh, from the front of the box we have uh, three rather grumpy forlorn men. Um, and a line of Union soldiers. It, it doesn't look like it just looks like yeah. a knockoff Gettysburg. I know. But and it has Martin Sheen. <laughs> Just like Gettysburg, using his Robert E. Lee voice, even though he's in a, a Union uniform, he's just playing his Robert E. Lee character. It's great. So, um, in this uh, review, Daryl's going to be taking the stance of a historical advisor and Civil War historian, and I will be taking the stance of a B-movie connoisseur. We're just being us? Yes. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> but, um... I really want to say that I think this film is excellent. I know. There's some beautiful quotable lines. No horse. Mercy. Well, we know why there are no horses, right? Hmm. Why are there no horses? Why are there no horses? I'm actually blanking. It's because there were so many cheval, chevaux de frise. <laughs> All three of them. There were, and they moved them from <laughs> scene to scene. And, you know, we, we talk about this. We were watching Game of Thrones. And, and I pull this same trick in every film I'm working on, too. There's just the one cheval de frise. And, and, and for those of you that don't know, cheval de frise is this... Um, it's a it's a log with um, various um, poles, sharpened poles put through it. It's you kind of just it's this like trellis X shaped thing that is a, a barrier against uh, cavalry or infantry, um, mostly for cavalry so that horses won't jump over it or onto it. And uh, I have to. I place them everywhere. I will bring them to movie sets. I'll move. I'll put them up, up at reenactments, and we always saw them in Game of Thrones. There will always be one cheval de frise in a uh, in the battle. It'd just be there's the one. That's why there were no horses. And then the plural is chevaux de frise. So there would be this one had the guy must have had three. Yeah. The three were everywhere. So it was it was it was great. It was is one of one of my bag of tricks. That's why there are no horses. One one of the things about um, things you see in the background of things, you often see these baskets of fire as well. Yes. My father finally explained to me what those actually are. Yeah. Like they are a legitimate thing, at least as recently as the sixties. Okay. They're just to create heat for the area. They're not about light. They're just to create heat for the area. That's what the baskets of fire are. Yeah. So I wonder if they actually are a thing and just, you know. Yeah, maybe they are, maybe they are a thing, were a thing. Um, but they're that's... they're usually used in as medieval light. settings. Yeah, yeah, as as medieval, as light. Me, yeah, medieval settings as light. And they're not good for that. Yeah, and and Lindy Beige will tell you much about that. Indeed. That's that's a great that's a great episode. But anyway, so uh let let's let's start going through the plot. I can't <laughs> there's, just, there's so much 
Okay, so we I mean we get we get introduced to all of our major characters, and it just starts out with all the major. I so I, I want to start off by saying that the reason why most people haven't seen the director's cut is apparently because it had to be re-edited because it was too artsy. Okay. So we we open with this voiceover with photos, which yeah, oh, I I kind of I I don't know they I mean there were the some of them were actual pictures that have been reworked and then some of them were uh, like made. To, to kind of recreate similar historical scenes, I, I kind of... I mean, it was incredibly boring, but it was like, oh, cool concept. Yeah, I didn't like looking at all the amputees and injuries and all that. Yeah. It was unsettling. Which, you know, this is a horror film. This was supposed to be scary. Were you scared? So scared. So, um, we, we, we open up with uh, seeing the aftermath of a battle. And there's these Union soldiers. Yes, and they have just come from the tailor. <laughs> because they are all so clean with their dress uniforms on. This one, the tropes of this movie, for for me at least, are awkward harmonica, sashes. Because they <laughs> all have to have their gloves and sashes on like they're going to the ball. Well, it's important. And the Chevelle de Freeze. We're in, and we see it throughout all those things. This is true. Yep. So we we they, so they got their sashes on and they're looking for they're they're going to a battle. Yeah, they're going to the aftermath of a battle because uh, a group of soldiers has gone missing, and they find all these men. They say crucified. Yeah, but they're they're up on these like big X's. Yeah. They, um, Trestles, what we yeah. call them. Yeah, but they're 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 crucified like Saint Andrew. I don't know how else to just describe it. Yeah. But they're uh, you know, on an X, upside down. Yeah, that gets explained later. They are all Saint Andrew. What does not get explained <laughs> is why one of them has a belt buckle in his mouth. Yes, so he has the belt buckle in his mouth, and it very conveniently says Fifty First Alabama. Mm-hmm. Like every unit had their own custom belt. Yes. Why not? Well, they're all, they can't all be Patrick. I was going to say I have my own custom belt buckle. I know you do. I know you do. <laughs> so, yeah. um, it, it's implied that there's a bunch of torture and terrible things have happened at this place. And so, for some reason, they're like, hey, we need to go track down the uh, leader of the 51st. Yep. And get him to help us track his boys down. Perfect. So, they go to a prison... No, but first they gotta mm. they gotta go to the general. Yes, and yes, the, they have the whole general and Martin suit. Sheen, like General Lee in blue, needs to. Uh, <laughs> first, he's getting a portrait painted of himself. I missed that somehow. Yeah, he was it, it, with this with this stereotypical painter who's dressed in white with like the full palette. Like, it's very cartoonish, and then for some, it's so absurdist. There's like a uh, uh, there's a uniformed soldier. In the corner, playing the cello, playing the baccarini on the cello, and there's uh, a couple other officers. There's Ray Wise in there with his like brand new uniform with the with the shoulder boards that are so brand new they're still straight as a board, as it were, not even curled onto the shoulder. And uh, the one the one thing I loved from that scene was they actually had the headstand. From, um, like, use in tin types, and I'm sure there must have been ones that they used for uh, painting portraits. But it's it's specifically this metal stand. Yeah. That and there are there's one interesting photo you can go look up of Grant getting his photo taken with this stand behind him, and it's this stand that would get adjusted up to your height, and there's a little like fork thing that. You just rest on the back of your head, mm -hmm. and it makes it so you don't move. Yeah, and and it really does work because I, I I've had a lot of tin types taken of me, and every time, every time I'm ever so I move ever so slightly, I'm ever so slightly blurry. And uh, but this tool was in it. That's kind of cool. I know. 
that's that's as accurate as it got. So <laughs> so keep going. They went to the military prison, yes. which is conveniently next door in a barn. Bowling Green. Yes. Bowling Green Penitentiary. Penitentiary barn. <laughs> Where uh, we meet our confederate that we will be uh, tagging along with for the rest of the film. And pee bucket. <laughs> There's an awkward pee bucket scene. Yep. And uh, that's when we get to see... Um, we uh, Now, when that scene starts, we then cut to a battle that's going on between the Union and the Confederacy. The Confederates are holed up in a house... The Union soldiers are besieging. Them. Oh, oh, the house, the uh, the reinforced concrete barn, you know, because yes. it can withstand like ten different explosive shell from like a cannon that's like ten feet away. Well, the cannon was mostly missing, but yeah. Oh no, it was hitting parts of the barn, and the part <laughs> of the barn was exploding. So it's like this reinforced barn. Yeah, and they're firing back at the Union soldiers. And then we find out there's some slaves uh, held up in the uh, the top of the house. Yep. And uh, there's a guy with a stutter for some reason. Yep. Character building. Yep. And our Union soldiers see that there's some Confederates coming out of the fog. My favorite thing before, because I, I, I have my notes from this movie. Yes. You took more notes than just about anyone else. I know. I know. My favorite one is they use this vest pistol, okay. it's this little screw barrel pistol, um, as a flare gun, and they yes. like launch flares near onto the barn. Yeah, yeah. And I mean, flares. One flares aren't a thing in the Civil War. That in in that regard, there are like signal rockets. But those are like for the Navy. <laughs> and there are a couple that are, you know, on the books in the ordnance manual, but they're not they're not common and they're not used like World War One flares. I was gonna say they definitely cut to him later and he's holding a World War One flare gun. Yeah, but this this one they definitely started with this like little little screw barrel vest pistol. It's funny because I didn't see that, but I did see them switch it. I noticed that it was a different yeah. thing than he was holding yeah. earlier. Um, and then we saw we saw the the Game of Thrones one cheval yes. right in front of the barn. No, no, uh, no horses getting near that barn. No horse. No horse. And and I know I say it as a joke, but and I do say it every single time, every single reenactment I bring a cheval de frise to. It does actually make horses nervous. Like huh. like Reed uh, when he brings his horse, he like. The horse actually gets kind of like um, finicky about moving anywhere near it because I mean they are, you know, large spikes that are up near its face. Yeah. Um. So it's it's uh, uncomforting, unsettling. Yeah, it is unsettling to a lot of horses. Yes, unsettling to the equines. But, so, uh, oh yeah, and then we had uh, using a drum for ten men and a cannon because oh. you need drum commands for that. Yes, and then we have the sadistic drummer for the rest of the movie. Yes, explosive shot at 20 yards. Um, charging at the right shoulder shift. Um, which was, the, it, when they're going at the double quick, you should go to right shoulder shift, of course. But there were no bayonets on. So they yeah. were going to charge in a single column with no bayonets. Yep. That's the best way to fight zombies. <laughs> well, they don't know they're zombies at this point. And, and I didn't know... I mean, can can we spoil plot lines now? Yeah. I mean, we know that the the Billy Bob Thornton character likes to like sadistically play the harmonica at random times, and that wasn't explained until like three quarters of the way through the film, and so it was just awkward harmonica trope. I yeah. just thought it was like you know you're in the middle of this very tense scene and then happy harmonica song. Yeah. It was very weird. Very weird. Awkwardly placed harmonica trope. So our our Union soldiers gallantly go off to die. Yep. And um, then the Confederates are like suspicious when they, yeah. s which is weird. And they see they say, "Keep one shot loaded." <laughs> yes. <laughs> what else are we gonna do, sir? <laughs> let me let me let me throw in an extra bullet in down here. Okay. Um. 
but no, the, the thing I, felt, I thought was funny about that scene is, like, they clearly think that these are Confederate reinforcements. And then the Union goes off and doesn't come back. Yeah. And then they see the Confederate reinforcements and they're like, hey, we don't trust you. <laughs> <laughs> yep. Um, which is just kind of weird at first. And then, of course, you know, their, their trust is misplaced. And uh, I, I love the scene where, you know, our, our Confederate leader is being held by a knife at his throat and he yells mercy. Yeah, I think that's one of the other tropes of this movie is that you cannot be killed by a blade unless you're in a headlock. Yeah, there's only one time they use a bayonet, like an actual bayonet. And you can tell they really set that up. But even when they're threatening people with a full sword. Yeah. they got to be in a headlock. Yep. Yeah. Do you know why? No. Oh, it's very easy to make blood that way. Like oh, you, okay. For okay. You know, an effect. Yeah, there we go. But it's a $1.2 million film. I guess they blew it all on the actors. I guess so. Did it all go to Martin Sheen? Because, I mean, he had, he had, just, he had just done... Uh, Maybe this is what he did before. I don't think so. No, he was already famous. Okay. I, and, I just like uh, to believe that this film made people. Because it's, no. it's Matt LeBlanc's uh, first role. Yeah. And, and uh, well, I mean, Billy Bob Thornton movie. had not done Sling Blade yet. I mean, that's, that's his, his big role there. I don't know what that is. So, anyway... Um, so yes, we have this scene and our stutterer eventually ends up, uh, being the only Confederate left alive and they go up to him and they're like, we wanted to make sure nothing happened to the young one. I know. Like, it, yeah. That, that was really, really creepy. There's a lot of subtle... Because of your youth. Yeah. Goodness and mercy and sweetness and light, Murphy. Yeah. Yeah. yeah I, I, I like, I, I, like, I had, to, I had to write that one down cause that was pretty good. But before there... He eats the raw corn for no reason. Yes. It's like that's that's to prove his um prove his undeadness is that he's able to eat corn. Eat raw corn. Especially because there's there's not a lot of sweet corn in the nineteenth century <laughs> and there's uh you know, it's mostly dent corn, so it even if it was cooked it would be super difficult to eat. This is true. Yeah. I'm referencing our future <clears throat> grains Krieger cast. That'll be a grain time. Uh, yes. And, uh, but yeah, they are all poetic zombies. I yeah. had also wrote down, because this is such a quotable film. It is. Yeah. I will consume your bones and scatter the dust to the wind. <laughs> all right. We also forgot that uh, our lead zombie, um, the harmonica player. Yeah. Gets a little rapey with our... He's always rapey. He's rapey with men and women. Well, see, th that was one of the things I wanted to bring up is... Part part of this film... Um, a spoiler alert to uh, my audience. Uh, I I've watched this film previously, and so I was looking forward to this. <laughs> and um, I, I watched it with one of my friends, and we were making jokes about like all this subtle homoeroticism that it runs throughout the film. And... Uh, Turns out that does indeed come to a head later in the film, which we'll talk about yeah, weird. when we get to that point. But this is one of those moments where they're like swooning over this sweet, young Goodness thing. and mercy and sweetness and light, Murphy. <laughs> <laughs> and, then, and then drum roll plus screaming, which is another trope of the movie. Yeah. They do it like four times and it's super awkward. He then, drum roll plus screaming. He then shoots himself. Yeah. Our stutter shoots himself. Which then leads us to like the best thing in the movie. Is it crime scene tintypes. Printed out on normal photo paper. Yep. Because they took this tint. Yeah, we have crime scene tintypes and then they did printouts and distributed them. Yes. Yep. Because that's important. Yes. Amazing. And possible. Yes. <laughs> uh, so this inspires our confederate to join forces. And they end up taking him outside. They give him back his clothing. He makes a crack about, I got this back when we got Texas. Uh, yeah. 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 And everybody's in their bleach white sutler shirts and, you know, perfect clothing again. Yeah, it's pretty awesome. 
And then we meet our stereotypically British civilian that was bumbling about. He's been there since the beginning. Has she? Uh, really? Yes. When? When they were pulling the belt buckle out of the guy's mouth. Yeah. He was talking about how the guy, like, that was in front of the guy with the belt buckle, like, you know. I did uh, not notice That him. was his brother. Really? Yeah, and he's not a photographer. Mm. Like, that's not... He's not a, like, they call yeah, him a I photographer. Ex- yeah, I expect him to be the photographer. They, they call him a photographer and he very well may be a photographer, but the reason he has the camera, this is the best part. Yeah. The reason he has the camera is because they find it at the battle earlier okay. when they go to the battle. Okay. So he has the camera, like he finds the camera at the battlefield and the Colonel, yes, Colonel, uh, yeah. says to him, will this thing tell us what happened here? <laughs> Because like there was a camera the, the set up. Crime scene photography. Yeah. Yes. Well, no, like that 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 it was like recording. Yeah, it was live. recording. <laughs> yes. <laughs> it was recording live footage of the battle. And so yeah, that that he's like, this is my brother's camera, and so that's the yeah. He he very well may be a photographer as well, but the point was he came looking for his brother, and that's why he tags along because he wants to know what happened to his brother. And then before they go on the journey, he gets a shave and then yep. insults the black men that shaved him and says, yep. just like home. That's <laughs> how I missed that thing. <laughs> yeah. That was a, that was... And oh. then they handcuff him to the, uh, to the Rebecca. Yeah. 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 But this are. With modern handcuffs, by the way. There's no shackles or anything. That's just full on modern handcuffs. Our Confederate probably has the most um, development in the movie. Like, he goes from, like, this hardcore uh, racist... very sharp character arc. It's it's such a wave. It develops. He, it develops. He goes from just, like, horrible racist and, like, super stubborn person to open-minded... You know, abolitionist. Yeah, open-minded abolitionist. That fights for the South. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, he ends up, like, loving Rebecca. Yeah. And... and There's yeah, a reason. It, it's very confusing. Maybe. So, um, this is when the greatest line in the film is uttered. We have our confederate tied to uh, our voodoo priestess woman. Spoiler alert. And, uh, and he would like transportation. Yes, he says, can I, we, have a horse? No horse! No horse. It's my, my favorite line. It's good. It's good stuff. And then as soon as they step off, a very cheery soldier music. Yes. And they start singing about mustaches. Yep. It was, <laughs> yep. And then all their accoutrements are around their knees. You know, I mean, not really, but I mean, their, their canteens are crazy and everybody's doing the the uh the i I don't know for lack of a better word trope i use trope again of the uh your canteen cup uh strapped on the outside of your haversack and little things that are just they're they're just they're just so bad do you suppose they didn't like having the um i'm gonna go out on a limb here and say the reason why they didn't have the um bayonets on the guys in the uh, night fight scene at the house was because it was actually filmed at night and they maybe didn't want the danger maybe maybe because Because that one did feel like it was filmed at night yeah and the later fight scenes where they are using bayonets are definitely day for night yeah so maybe maybe I mean, and and a lot of them were they are reenactors I mean, I know a lot of the guys that are in them and the um the guys that coordinated it definitely reenactors, and uh, I actually I, I did a I did a uh, a low budget film like sort of like this not as low I mean, lower budget than Ghost Battalion slash Grey Knight slash the Killing Box. You gotta get all of the, <laughs> the names that you know it's good with the three names. But yes. uh, no, I just worked on um, something with. One of the guys that was in this. Hmm. It's great. No, two of the guys that were in this. Yeah, Matt LeBlanc and... No, no, it was uh, <laughs> Peter Chirico and uh, Heath Hammond. But, uh, um, and it was probably filmed in the exact same place because Tennessee looks like, you know, the California desert. Are we indeed sure that they're filming in Tennessee? I'm pretty sure it was in California. 
Yeah, it's got to be. Yeah, no, I'm, I'm, I'm saying it. It looked just like oh. that. Yeah, where we were filming looked exactly like that. Yeah, you know, there's the one tree. <clears throat> yes. <laughs> yes, and we'll talk about the one tree later. But uh, yeah, very cheery music. But you know, I mean, it's it's. It, I always say like '90s reenactors. I mean, they're this is not not only pre-internet, but a lot of research wasn't available um and and there wasn't that level of authenticity that we have today um so a lot of the reenactorisms that we have today and we recognize today just weren't a thing back then i mean i i it's 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 only 30 years ago but you know 20 something years ago but you know, you got to forgive some of the things, like, some of them. like everyone wearing sashes. The, I, I, I still and like it, this it is, it is, it is gray night. I mean, I can't nitpick it. It's not like they're trying to be you know, an actual like, historical, you know, historically accurate film. This is true, but but I, I might as well. <laughs> but I'm going to say that this film. Gave a lot of inspiration to two future classics. Okay, give me give me the two future classics. First, uh, Game of Thrones. Because we have these zombies, right? Walkers, if you will. Oh. That are coated in white paint, making them white walkers. No, right? stop. And what do these white walkers fear? Fire. No, stop. No. And water. Bad. I mean, how do you prevent yourself from becoming a When did walker? Game of Thrones come out? As a book series? Yeah. I don't know. I think it's the 80s. Well, then how fortunate Gur Martin was to be able to rip off something from the future. <laughs> I, okay. I, I'm saying it. What was the second thing? I'm going to say it right here, right now. Gur Martin ripped off Grey Knight. <clears throat> the other one is... Um, wait, wait. I'm actually... I got it here. Yeah? He did. He ripped it off. Oh, snap. He ripped it off Grey Knight because A Game of Thrones was published in 1996. So he had three years to study up on Grey Knight. Yeah. Okay. This, this okay, is... I believe you now. <laughs> it's not just a conspiracy theory. What's the second thing that... that uh... That stole from Ghost Battalion? Well, Hollywood remade this film. Did they? They did. But they remade it under a different name. Abraham Lincoln Vampire Hunter. Okay, we gotta get to that, though. Yeah. I mean, with the whole silver plot, is that what you're yeah. talking about? Okay. Well, so that's one of the things... We're, 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 the reason I'm bringing this stuff up is we're now at the point where these secrets are starting to be revealed. Where yeah. uh, our Confederate ends up running away, getting washed downstream into a cave. Yes, what? because the Union has artillery that can open portals to hell. To the unknown. Okay, so it's explained a little bit better than that, kind of. What happened was there is a river that can dump people into the river, right? Or dump people into this underwater cave. Okay. Okay. This underwater cave is a portal to hell. And that's where they all get got murdered when they surrendered, by the way. Yes. Yes. We kind of skipped over the fact that the Union are evil. Yeah. So this colonel was leading his troops. Yep. They, there was, uh, they were fighting at the bottom of a hill and at the top of the hill was a bunch of artillery, apparently. They and could then they, not win because the Union had the yes, high ground. Yes, they charged down... And then they surrendered, and then they shot them all anyway, and a portal opened up. Well, so the, port <laughs> the portal's been there for over 200 years. Yes. So it's been there since 1660. <laughs> okay. Three. I, oh, I was going to say, I like how you're pulling this out of nowhere, but I'm like, you paid attention about it, uh, but then I realized, yeah, you're just counting yeah. backwards. Yeah. Um... Yeah, so they're talking about how uh, there's there's like this flashback sequence to Africa, and there's these slave traders stealing people from the salt flats. Yeah, and then going into the, the African it's version. Definitely of the, salt flats. Yeah, yeah. 
the African version of the portal to hell. And he said it was 200 years ago. So it should they should be like 17th century traders, except they're definitely dressed 1770s. Mm. I am so pedantic. That 70s show. Oh, come on. So uh, apparently then the slave traders came back to the United States. Sure. Yeah. Um, opened a portal to hell here. Yes. <laughs> uh, near a creek. And then been throwing people into this creek. Yes. And Makes then, sense. Yep. And then these people uh, wash up into this cave that's underwater. Yeah. And the weak become food. And the strong become soldiers of the undead. Which is really interesting because we then never see Revolutionary War or Spanish American or Mexican American War. Yeah, yeah, Mexican War. We don't see their like soldiers from those eras. I which guess we should. not. That, I guess not. That is a plot hole. But uh, you know, it does explain why there's just stripes of white paint. It's they're going for the tribal vibe yeah. from it. But because uh, at first it was very confusing. Maybe they were just trying to save on white paint. And this all gets expositioned at us by a young boy in a circle of candles, who's being <laughs> held there because he is one of these ghost things. And as we all know, White Walkers hate fire. So, he so he's can, in a circle of candles. Yeah, so he can't go across. Eternal them. candles. Yeah. And yeah, someone's like going down there and relighting it. So at which point he bites our Confederate. And then it's not really made clear if the Confederate becomes one of these things or not. Which? He, we can't really tell if he's become. Oh, when own. he gets bit in the Cave yeah. of Wonders? Yeah. Yeah. Because he then comes out and like uh, makes out with the voodoo priestess's hand. Oh, yeah, no, I mean, he, it's clear that he now needs blood, and there's the the blood-smacking scene, as I called it. <laughs> it's a good minute of yeah. just this camera holding on this poor woman's face yeah. as lip-smacking happens in the background. Yeah. And then and then they move on, and everything's fine. And he's, <laughs> like, the next day he's just like, yep, never been better. And they they get going, and then there's another fun song, and they do they do my favorite version of Dixie, way down south in the land of traders. It's great, <laughs> it's great. Uh, and then and then another great quote: "It's a strange world, John." <laughs> As they pass that cemetery again with the stick crosses. Yes. Yeah. And there's like the 1930s house in the background that's burned down. Yep. Which is. And then, and then they we come upon the next battle, which another trope: hiding riflemen behind a wagon. Yep. You know, haven't even turned it over. Just this wagon will protect me. Well, we did. Did we come across that battle? Yeah, no, we came up on that battle now. Oh, okay. Yeah, no, the battle where they 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 come up from yeah. on high and then and then they get shot at and then they immediately surrender. They're like, "Oh my God, you're actual humans." Yeah. So then they surrender and now they're gonna work together. Yes, this is much like the last battle at Castle Ritter. Yes, this is just like. The, the 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 Wehrmacht and the Americans <laughs> teaming up to fight the SS. Perfect, <laughs> perfect reference. Wow. And then my one of my favorite lines. I have a lot of favorite lines, but the the uh, uh, Ray Wise uh, goes to leave because he's gonna go get help, and uh, he says he's near the Kentucky border, but then points to. The off the other uh, union officer says, "I can use you at Vicksburg," <laughs> so he knows where the next battle's really gonna be. <laughs> He's gonna bring him down to the siege of Vicksburg. Yeah, it's really weird, but it was a passing reference, I guess. Yeah, as he runs off. Okay, and then uh, so then keep going with we. we uh, we then have another night scene. Oh, yes. Day night scene. Day for night, where our confederate goes out to meet with the zombies. Yes, they come upon him. Yep. And then there's the... Uh, there's the exchange about what they are. And another thing where they need to be in a headlock. Yes. And then the weird kiss and spit scene. Yeah. So he, like, kisses him and is like... 
Oh, there was a you, bit more build up to I, this. It, it's it, but it's it's it is what it is. It's super creepy. It's funny because he's just like you need to be on our side. Gonna so, bro kiss you now, <laughs> and then he spits in his face. So our leader of these zombies goes on this existential diatribe about what death means and how he wants to unite the United States. And that he thinks picking sides is what's causing the death. And that we should all just join together as zombies. Okay. Yeah, like, it, it's trying to That be... was the true message of the film. Yes. Come okay. together, America. Yeah. In zombies. Okay. And voodoo magic. And voodoo magic. And then there's this... It's, it's, it is a long, drawn-out scene of them awkwardly close together. Yeah. And like, plot point... The Confederate colonel gave the watch, his watch, his grandfather's watch, was, which was apparently from the Revolutionary War, even though it's like a 60s Elgin, um, gave it to uh, the voodoo priestess. The voodoo pri priestess. And we determined that's because it's silver. And yes, and then she shows it to one of them, and he is freaked out. Yes. Yeah. That's the big, and that's where we go down the silver road, where we figure out, you know, there's, they are susceptible to silver, and, right? Yeah. Though there there are a few more awkward harmonica moments. Yes, but now that's, and that's when we where the reveal out is. That, yeah. yeah, that he's, um, that he's our awkward harmonica -ness. Yep. Harmonicist. Harmonicist. And there's another one of those Cheval de Frise. No horse. No horse. No horse. And then I, I, this, um, the scene, the, the, the line you like was where I actually found that, that, uh, Carl Clink was in it. That, uh, oh. He, he, this, this guy was my, um, reenacting hero when I was growing up. Because, uh. He was uh, super involved in the reenactments that we ran. He and my grandmother started the first uh, Civil War reenactment here in uh, Huntington Beach in 1993, which was actually when this was made. So maybe my reenactment is actually so your entire a life is because of, of Grey this. Knight. Yeah, it's all a knockoff of Grey Knight. Hmm. But yeah, they uh, and he actually does the line. Um, what about, what about silver and bayonets? Oh, Something. he says, uh, imagine what a silver bayonet would do. Yes. Because the the, the kid refers uh, in the cave, he talks about how there are three things. Fire. Well, he says, sun fire. Yeah. Which is weird. Yeah. I assumed that meant daylight, but fire in general, I guess. Yeah. Um, Pale metals. Okay. And moving water. Which is the, going back to uh, uh, where these things get this from. That is the things that hurt. Those are three of the four things that hurt uh, Hammer's Dracula. Huh. Played by Christopher Lee. Um, and it's funny because people keep... Uh, thinking they uh, threw in all these things like at the end of one of the Dracula films Dracula falls into a creek <laughs> and dies yeah. because running water. And I wonder if those are taken from the original book. I, I haven't read that in a long time. That's See that's the thing is I don't know if that's like a natural thing but what's interesting is in this particular context they're saying that it's uh, God's will which makes it think like maybe there's a line about that in the Bible somewhere like evil cannot pass the running waters or something like that because you know that's why like silver is a thing is because of the whole pieces of silver you know thing from the Bible so um, that makes sense you know that it would apply to both vampires and these Undead zombies, which, you know, everyone says they're zombies, but I'm actually going to go out on the limb and say they're vampires. Yeah? Yeah. Huh. They're, they're vampires. They drink blood. They don't actually eat you. Oh, yeah. They, um... <laughs> I didn't even think of that. Yeah. Yeah. They're yeah, vampires. If, if, yeah, if you had an entire... And it's described as a zombie movie yeah. by everyone. Except even, it's not. 
I mean, if you had like a horde of vampires, you'd be like, wow, this is the worst zombie movie I've ever seen. (laughs) (laughs) But if you think of it as like a vampire movie and they're just like. Because they're funny and and sadistic. And vampires. Yeah. Wow. And they're they're like. Maybe we're the dumb ones. They're funny and they're sadistic and they're sexual. Yeah, they're they're They're, vampires. It's all the vampire tropes. Yeah. Why didn't you say that at the beginning? Oh, because I wanted to build up to that. Oh, well, that's a great reveal. <laughs> Your analysis is spot on, and I'm I'm so disappointed I didn't catch that. Well, I, I did also point it out to you as a zombie film the whole time we were watching. Yeah, because that's well, the way it's, it's all sold. Your fault, Patrick. It is the way it's sold. Uh, but yes, it is a vampire film. So then we uh, we get the build up to all of these things to the silver <gasps> the silver battle. Wait, wait. That's even why they can't do the cross. They have to do an X. Yeah. Because. Oh my god. Yeah. So why does anyone talk about this as a zombie movie? I don't know. I actually don't know. That's really annoying. Yeah, because they're. Yeah. So we got build up to the zombie battle. And then when the (laughs) zombie battle starts. And they get finally overrun. We get the line of the movie. I'm British, for God's sake. <laughs> yes, our, our British photographer uh, doesn't like that he's getting involved with this. Yes. And there's another one where he's he, the colonel tells one of his soldiers to use the rebel yell as if it's, you know, the secret weapon. He says, let's teach them the rebel yell. Does he? Yeah. I thought he said, use the rebel yell. <laughs> like, use the rebel yell. Do it. Do it. Uh, yeah. And then so we get a boss battle with Civil War swords, you know. Well, we also, going back to that first okay. night, we, we have the return of the colonel who okay. comes back as a zombie. Yeah. As a vampire. And he explains why they've been crucifying them. You know, crucifying these people. Yeah. And he, and he says, it's not to torture them. It's to stop them from turning. Because apparently, to get these people to turn, a vampire has to kill them and lay them in the ground of their homeland. Which, oh. by the way, is another vampire trope. Yeah, well, that's yeah. that's another like original vampire trope. So, um, yeah, they get their 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 powers from the soil, and so it, just like the corn from the beginning. <laughs> That's corny. Um, so if they're up on a pyre, if they're up, you know, when they die, they can't be resurrected. So it's to keep the weak from turning, as he said. So then we get the boss battle. Yes. Because Civil War swords can be used like medieval sword. Yep. Right. And then Rebecca saves the day. Yes, by shooting herself. Yes. And then we get another scary scream death. Where everyone's screaming for no reason. And then drums. Well, yeah, and then we get the final uh the final uh vampire shows up and like has this touching moment with the corpse. Yeah, he like vampire. he's not dead yet. And he like starts putting the harmonica in his mouth. Yeah. Like, like play please, it again. Please Sam. play it. Please. And then uh and then our captain comes back and uh does his Gang member pistoleering again. We didn't even mention that, by the oh, way. Oh, well, yeah, he's been doing that the whole time. Yeah. He, he just takes out his pistol and holds it, it to the side. Yeah. But then uh, we get gunshot fade to black. Billy Bob Thornton, no more. And then there's the next morning. <laughs> and then the next morning. It could have just ended there. And they buried all the people. More stick crosses, which are just stuck in the ground. Yes. There's no evidence that... They're, they're, they either they regrew the the sod, and then killed it, so it matched the ground, so it looked like <laughs> no one had ever dug up there. And it was so awkwardly close to a tree that you knew they weren't digging through those roots. So pedantic. So pedantic. Anyway, and then we get their epilogues, yes. right? You know, and he just resigned, and then this captain keeps working under Grant and. You know, and the Confederate goes off and fights at Gettysburg, and 
all these other battles. And then And you know what's back right mm. at the those last scenes? Mm. No horses. Because oh God. Cheval de Frise protecting that cemetery from the horses. <laughs> As you yep. know, horses love to eat people. Yep. Much like eagles like to eat No horses. horse. No horse. <clears throat> That is an old reference. The eagles are turning people into horses. Hmm. Right? Hmm. Yeah. Yeah. I was, I was referencing things. Okay. I drop all sorts of references. Well, I'm at the end of my four pages of notes. Well, <clears throat> so some things I, I, I have failed to bring up to this point. It has an awesome soundtrack. It, yeah. There's yeah. a surprising amount of, of like actual classical pieces well and so i thought that the 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 i thought that the main theme running throughout the film was this particular uh, piece by johann sebastian bach and it is in the released version but not in gray knight it is a custom piece for gray knight wow and that that little bit of music uh really adds a lot to the scenes it's used in it's misused in a couple scenes but you know beyond that it's pretty nice so is the harmonica i, I think the, the harmonica serves a purpose uh, but but it should have been like creepy, sadistic, like eerie. It was. It wasn't. It, it, wasn't it was like there was an eerie scene, and then they played a a happy song over it. Yeah, that's the point. You didn't like hear it in the distance. It was just like, boom, harmonica is part of the soundtrack. Okay, I suppose, but. Probably the only way they could film it. And you didn't hear any reaction from anyone. No one was like, what's that? Or no one was freaked out by it happening again and again. Oh, they were at the first. The In the first battle, the harmonica starts, and that's why everyone looks over and hmm. you know to see the zombies. I mean, vampires. 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 They're definitely vampires. Yeah. Can't believe I didn't catch that. Indeed. So, as we all know, this is the original Abraham Lincoln Vampire Hunter Slayer. Until next time, dear listener, see you out there. <laughs>